Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on what time zone you are. Welcome to the webinar, um, Why FIPS Matters, the Validator Security for a Secure Software Supply Chain. Now, in today's webinar, what we want to look at are a couple different things, right? First of all, what is FIPS? Uh, who needs it? Why? And how does that mean for your businesses to have FIPS validation or have a platform that is FIPS validated? And then also, mm, very important as well, the importance of noting the difference between FIPS compliance and FIPS validated, because the terminology is actually quite different uh, when it comes to the certification of FIPS. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Kevin Ung. I am a senior solutions architect at Mirantis. And my work really is to help folks uncover issues and guide them to a solution. Now, I've been working in the area of development, requirements management, continuous integration, testing, continuous deployment, and also monitoring on-prem or in the cloud for the last decade or so. Um, customers worked with varies in the industry from you know, consumer goods to finance to retail, and now have a common um, point, obviously, which is security and making sure that their environments are safe to work in. So jumping right into the first topic, what is FIPS and FIPS 140-2? And really to answer that, let's take a step back and talk about the institute that actually manages the FIPS specifications. And that is NIST, which is National Institute of Standards and Technology. Now, NIST is an agency of the United States Department of Commerce, and that really publishes and manages several important standards and guides. You may see some of those, such as the definition of cloud computing that you see over here, 800-145. And you know, pertinent to uh, recent initiatives, the government, uh, US government has mandated that all governmental agencies adopt zero trust architecture, which is SP 800-207. And obviously, FIPS 140-2, which outlines the security requirements for cryptographic modules and the topic of our webinar today. Now, FIPS standards are defined in a couple of different levels. So let's talk about that really quickly. If you look at this, FIPS, uh, which stands for Federal Information Processing Standards, are standards and guidelines for federal computer systems and developed by NIST in accordance with the Federal Information Security Management Act, or FISMA. You see, there's a lot of acronyms over here. And, but more importantly, it's also approved by Security Commerce. So there's quite a lot of um, the number of agencies behind this and actually goes ahead and, and you know, does a validation and there's pretty proper, um, uh, how should I say, um, scrutiny on the standards to make sure that it is up to the highest uh, levels of security. And so the, the order of operations is that NIST develops the FIPS standards which then provides different security levels, 140-2 um, being the second revision, and the latest one is 140-3. And so FIPS 140-2 is a standard that handles cryptographic modules and the ones that organization use to encrypt both data at rest and data in motion, so being transferred and also being stored. And as you can see on the screen over here, FIPS 140-2 has four levels of security, with level one providing component level security and level four being a fully hardened system. So starting with the, the, the bottom level, right? FIPS security level one, that is the most simplest of requirements. It kind of requires production grade equipment, at least one tested encryption algorithm. And it must be a working encryption algorithm, not one that has not been authorized for use. So on level one, um, you don't really have a specific physical security mechanism more on a software encryption level. Um, so it allows software and firmware components of cryptographic module to be executed on a general purpose computing system. So it's not a, you know, a, a full on hardened chip or anything, it's any computer that has that encryption method on it will satisfy FIPS 140 to level one. Now, when you start looking at level two, it enhances the physical security mechanisms of level one by adding the requirement for tamper evidence. So things such as a temper evident coding or seal put on a cryptographic module so that once it's, it, it needs to be broken to obtain physical access to the cryptographic keys and critical security parameters within the module. It also requires role-based authentication for which the module kind of authenticates the authorization of the operator 
to assume a specific role and perform corresponding sets of services. So essentially our back access. Now, when you go on to level three, it's further hardened. It adds a requirement for physical tamper resistance. That makes it difficult for people to get into the actual sensitive information, so lockbox and so on and so forth. Okay, so you got strong enclosures, tamper detection, response, um, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, same thing, it has identity-based authentication me mechanisms and um, you know, a, a more hardened system. And then once you get to security level four, then it's the most stringent and robust against different attacks, right? So, you know, whatever method you're coming in, think of it as, and this is gonna age me, think of um, the first Mission Impossible movie with Tom Cruise coming down the, um, the ceiling with the laser beams and the, uh, the, the, the pressure sensitive floors. That's kind of your, you know, a, a more exaggerated version of level four, but essentially there's detection all around. Um, and also used for in operations in physically unprotected environments. Now, for the most part, uh, most companies, it, it's um, level three is pretty much the more uh, practical and the, the highest level of security that most folks do, right? When you go up to level three. So if you look at that, um, let's look at how the individual components fit in. Now, at Mirantis, we're here. We got production grades components and a validated cryptographic module. So Mantis has obtained FIPS 140-2 level one uh, validation on a number of our components. And we'll go through some of those components and how they're validated in a few minutes. And if you think about this, who really needs this, right? For the most part, I, it, it's probably gonna be pretty hard to come across industries um, or individual companies, perhaps some industries will, but individual companies that need to go up to all the way to level four, that's pretty, um, pretty proper security, so to speak, right? So even at the highest of levels, most people get to level three. For the most part, uh, level one and level two are going to be sufficient for a number of the companies. But, you know, talking about industries that may need this, uh, obviously, the first one would be any companies that are working with government agencies. Uh, so for example, uh, this special publication 800-53 gives a catalog of security and privacy controls for all U.S. federal information systems, and that refers to FIPS 140. So if you're um, in any connected any connection to the government and are uh, within the organization, that would be one of the requirements in, in, in terms of cryptographic security. Some of the other things that may need FIPS, right? and you may come across these standards as well, so for example, FedRAMP for cloud applications, uh, a STIG if you're working once again with um, federal agencies, um, also things like PCI DSS. So, you know, um, when you're in regulated industries such as finance, telco healthcare, this gives you a standard for protecting your uh, transmission of sensitive information, right? So within, let's say for the healthcare industry, HIPAA, has a requirement to make sure that all information that is um, uh, a, a, um, a sensitive information, such as the name in conjunction with the address, date of birth, um, and so on and so forth, that is protected both at rest and in transit. And also it's not uh, available to anybody that has uh, no authorization to use it, right? So that's in the healthcare side of things. You obviously have that for the finance industry, and also for healthcare, and if you're in Canada, also for um, data relating to minors. Okay, so looking at some of that, right? What are the um, what are some of the requirements? So when you look at each of these uh, standards, where does FIPS come into play? So first of all, going at the FedRAMP, right? You can see over here to achieve FedRAMP designation, you would need to make sure that uh, your solution requires the use of FIPS 140 validated encryption for your multi-factor authentication tools. So if you're doing multi-factor authentication, of course you have the FIPS in your actual application, but also wherever you're running it in, especially if it's containerized or using orchestration, you wanna make sure that full stack is FIPS validated as well. Now, working in government, we have the security technical implementation guide, and this is one that um, we are working closely with a lot of the federal uh, uh, organizations as well um, to make sure that 
the implementation is um, stigged, so to speak. It requires algorithms that are FIPS compliant for encryption, hashing, and signing, and so on. Now, when you're in the payment industries, your PCI SSC um, also has uh, hardware security modules that comply with FIPS 140 security level three and so on to ensure that you know, payment information that is being transferred back and forth is actually secure and encrypted. So this is really, you know, depending on the industry that you're in, um, these uh, standards and guidelines all require FIPS. So how does Marantis fits into this? Um, now, Marantis, we recently required, uh, acquired an updated certification uh, for FIPS 140-2 validation, okay? And that means a couple of different things if you're a customer of Marantis or a potential customer, you know, what does that announcement mean? Now, first of all, it means that security is important to us as a company, and we want to provide a high level of security for our customers, yourself. Uh, second, the updated certification means that we've updated the reach of FIPS through more of our product portfolio. Now, previously, it was container runtime, now, we also have FIPS validation on the Marantis Kubernetes engine, uh, which is our orchestrator, including both Kubernetes and Swarm. And it also covers our lightweight Kubernetes distro K0s that can be deployed onto uh, minimal machines on the edge or near edge. Now, many of our customers also go through their own FIPS uh, certification, and our software is part of their software stack. So what this certification means is that we essentially won't be in the way of achieving your certification. So for customers not pursuing FIPS, it really means that we have secure communication. So you could prove a compliancy of whatever um, security um, codes or security standards that your industry needs to go through, right? So, um, you know, once you prove FIPS, you know that the encryption, at least um, in the trans uh, data transfer, between components within orchestrators or within the runtime is actually going to be secure and validated. Now for the security folks here, when we look at security in the context of containerization or cloud or with orchestration, um, how does that fit into everything? And we look at the Kubernetes security, the most commonly used model is the 4C model of code, container, cluster, and then your cloud you know, colo, corporate data center infrastructure, right, on the different levels. So in the context of achieving FIPS validation, the order essentially would be your application code is here. If you want to do full stack uh, FIPS validation, you want to make sure that your application code goes through the, uh, your uses FIPS uh, 140 um, compliant encryption methods and go through the validation on there. Now, a lot of customers actually take our container runtime and then essentially we act as an OEM to their virtual appliance, right? So the container runtime shifts with the code. And so that's where the Marantis container runtime uh, comes into play. So we have FIPS 140-2 validation on the actual runtime. So when you, when you ship your container along with the application code as a virtual appliance, the entire thing could be FIPS validated because your component, the actual runtime it's running on is already validated. So that makes it a lot easier for you uh, for your application uh, appliance to be validated as well. If you take it a step further and look at the actual um, container orchestration side of things, um, the Marantis Kubernetes engine, or actually at the same time K0s, is also FIPS 140-2 validated. So everything, if there's, if now we're looking at it as a platform, right? This entire stack over here, this virtual appliance of the uh, application deployment, the application runtime and then the application code, uh, we've already taken away the, uh, the cluster and the container validation efforts away for you. So this way you can focus really on your application code, get that validation and your entire stack would once again be validated. Okay. And then of course that'll run on any infrastructure of your choice, it could be on any cloud, it could be on your private uh, data center, it could be even on uh, a metal on demand provider such as Equinix Metal. And that um, essentially is going to be a portable um, appliance that can work in any environment. So giving you multiple cloud capabilities also uh, reduces the friction of you deploying this to your customer's environment because whatever environment your customers are running on will work on that no problem. And now we talked about what FIPS is. 
we kind of talked about why FIPS, and we looked at how FIPS is uh, applied to the different levels of your application uh, stack. So comes now. This is we want to come down to one very important topic, and which is how do we know if someone actually achieved um, FIPS compliance, right? Or actually, more importantly, how do we know uh, we someone has achieved FIPS certification? So in the context of FIPS, you you hear the terms FIPS compliant and FIPS validated. And the word being used obviously is very important. Now, FIPS compliancy merely tells you that the software was built following FIPS guidelines. So if the FIPS guidelines are actually out there, it's public publication. So anybody could go on the NIST website, search for FIPS 140-2, FIPS 140-3, and the document's there for you to follow. Okay, so it either means when we develop, when we de uh, develop our application, when we deploy our environment, we follow the guidelines um, in our view, uh, and that is compliant to the FIPS guidelines. Or um, some also may say, you know, parts of our software is FIPS validated. We may use a component that is validated, such as MCR or Matrix Container Runtime. We may use other encryptions in parts of our application, but the full stack is not validated. So it, it's actually quite very different to someone claiming that their application stack is FIPS validated because validation means the software has been reviewed, tested, and approved by a NIST approved testing lab. So the, the validation process is a, it's, it's not a very, it's not a very uh, multi-step process. As you can see over here, the flowchart is relatively straightforward, but there is a lot of documentation. There's a lot of um, proof points that you must uh, provide to the labs and also to NIST um, to ensure that NIST can then come back and issue a validation certificate to your application. So what you will go through is it's usually gone through a lab, right? It's, it's an accredited lab. So you have your software stack. It'll be sent to the accredited lab um, to uh, assist and go through test reports of the module, be it a container runtime, an orchestrator, or along with your application code as well. And then the results are being sent over to NIST and CSC for validation. So if there's any information, the lab and NIST then goes back and forth, make sure everything's provided and may come back to you as well to make sure that you have all the documentation required. And then once uh, ready, the certificate is then um, issued to the vendor, uh, such as yourself or us. And it is also being added to a list of FIPS 140-2 modules, which you can actually find on the NIST website as well. Right? So the CMVP will give you the list of everything that is uh, validated. And the cryptographic module validation program, or the CMVP at the very last step, is a joint effort between NIST and the Container, uh, Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. And that, once again, is a publicly available list. Uh, the web uh, address is on the screen. And Mantis, of course, is on that. Uh, we also have our cryptographic module certificate uh, for our runtime orchestrator, and that is publicly available as well. Uh, I've added the link over here as a QR code, but it's also you could go on to the validated modules and search for the vendor of what you're working with and to find if they're actually on that list. So in summary, the importance of FIPS validation, it, it used to be uh, primarily centered around governmental, you know, federal, um, agencies or and um, people that actually work with them. Now it's actually expanded a little bit more from just governmental usage to various other industries. So whether you have business in the federal space, your finance, healthcare, or even retail, uh, having this FIPS validation will give you peace of mind that your important data is being protected by the highest of standards. So it's very important that you select when you're going through your um, uh, application deployment, a container runtime and a container orchestrator that'll accelerate your security implementation and your process for obtaining FIPS validation. And something like Marantis Container Runtime and Marantis uh, Kubernetes Engine that already has FIPS 140-2 validation would actually accelerate your path to achieving your own validation as well.
Now, to find out more, uh, please visit marantis.com or scan the QR code on screen. That'll you know, get you to the website right away. That pretty much concludes the information part of the webinar. So it's been great to be able to share this information with you and look forward to seeing all of you in the upcoming webinars. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good day.